Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today on best lessons learned from FDA warning letters in relation to calibration. Uh, my name is Tracy Serzin, uh, president of PGLA, and with me today we have Walter Noison from uh, IndieSoft, who will be uh, presenting on our topic. Next slide. I'm trying to click. Okay, okay so today uh, we're going to be touching on uh, information on uh, data that uh, Walter has retrieved, I'm sure over time, um, from the FDA data database, how to get into that database to, to review some of these citations. And he's going to go over some common findings uh, regarding calibration uh, issues and, and how to prevent them. And then we're going to have some time um, for, for some questions and answer at the end. Next slide. Just some webinar housekeeping. This is uh, going to be recorded. So if you have to step off for a little bit and need to uh, download this later, this will be available on our website. Um, there's the link there where you can also obtain this. If you haven't noticed, all attendees are muted and you will remain muted for the entire uh, webinar. But please, as you're going through uh, this webinar uh, and you know, something comes to mind and you have a question, please utilize your question toolbar on the far right. And we're gonna be answering those questions towards the end. Next slide. Okay, so before we get started, I always like to bring in, uh, you know, how 17025 relates to what Walter's gonna be talking about. And primarily what he's gonna be talking about again is citations that have been documented uh, by the FDA uh, in regards to calibration. But some things to think about is multiple sections in 17025 require testing labs or even calibration labs to maintain their equipment and ensure that it's uh, appropriate for use, which could be making sure that it's calibrated appropriately, ensuring you're using accredited resources. And then also, which is somewhat of a new section um, that a lot of laboratories when the standard transitioned from 17 to 05 or from 05 to 17 excuse me um, was this externally provided products and services is to make sure that everyone that you're using is uh, suitable for what for what they're doing so for example for calibration uh, you might again consider using a 17025 accredited source to do your calibration and again it's really important to make sure you keep up with the, with the maintenance of your equipment. Um, and again, uh, Walter's gonna be going over some examples today. So this is just to kind of show you how this all relates to, to Walter's topic and I'm interested to, to hear about these citations. Okay, Walter, next slide. Okay, so I'd like to officially uh, welcome Walter, um, is the Life Science Product Manager for IndieSoft Corporation. He works with development, marketing, and sales to ensure that IndieSoft is optimized to support calibration quality systems and in regulated industries while being compliant with FDA, GMP, and ISO requirements. He has over 35 years of calibration and leadership experience with Medtronic, the world's largest medical device manufacturer, and with the US Marine Corps. Um, he also is the co-chair of NCSL, International Healthcare Metrology Committee, and is the section coordinator for the Minnesota section. As a co-author of the third edition of the ASQ Metrology Handbook released in January of 2023. Also participates in a writing group um, under the recommended practices for calibration quality systems for healthcare. And Walter has a master's degree in engineering management from St. Cloud State University, Minnesota, and is a fellow of the American Society of Engineer Management. So with that, Walter, I welcome you. I will let you go ahead and take over. Thank you for, for hosting us today. Well, thank you, uh, Tracy and Kristen of and Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation for hosting this webinar and for inviting me to present. I really appreciate it, the opportunity. I also want to thank everyone for who's attending today and taking time away from your valuable work uh, to see what uh, we will talk about with best lessons learned from FDA warning letters related to calibration. Um, we already go, went over my background, but one thing I want to touch on is in my free time, I'm the Vice President of North Star Camaro Club of Minnesota, 
where I get to enjoy my 1977 Camaro Sports Coupe that I bought brand new when I was 19 years old back in 1977. Makes me feel young again whenever I'm in it. <clears throat> Our objectives for the webinar is to, to learn how to use the FDA websites for searching observations and findings. Then review uh, the top eight calibration related FDA warning letters 483s that have been recently posted in the last several years. Have some discussions involving best practices on how to avoid similar occurrences. Pass along lessons learned from uh, these citations. Kind of webinars broken down in the background, general observations, go over the warning letters, and then end with some key takeaways before we open it up for Q&A. All the data that I'll present to you uh, is coming from the FDA's website. Uh, back in 2005, when I was attending one of the NCSLI annual conferences, I was at the Evening Healthcare Metrology Committee, where someone raised their hand and recommended that someone should research the FDA warning letters to see if we can see some trends on calibration issues. And I guess I hadn't learned from my days in the Marine Corps that you shouldn't raise your hand to volunteer. <laughs> But I raised my hand and volunteered to do uh, to do the research that year, and I'm still doing it nearly 20 years later. So quite quite the experience. But hopefully that you'll see from the webinar today is that by doing some research of the public data available from the FDA, we can see what the trends are in our different areas of interest. So we can stay ahead of it, as it were, and protect our companies and our organizations uh, from violations. The two areas that we'll talk about that the FDA has provided, and FDA being a, a government agency where our tax dollars uh, go to work, they need to provide transparency for the information that they have and share it with the public. And so they do that through two websites one being the, the warning letters website and one being the 483 observations and i'll go over each of those uh here shortly since 2005 these two websites uh have gone through quite the transition and in actuality back in 2005 there only was one site and that was the warning letters so you really couldn't get to see the 483 findings then eventually that came online they have, through the years, gone through uh, iterations of improvement, but then take a couple steps back. For some reason, they, uh, the websites lose some features and benefits, and then they, uh, a year or two later, they come back on. It's just kind of interesting how that has evolved over the past 17 years. Um, the warning letters used to be the better site, but I'd have to say right now, the 483 is the better site, and I'll show you why here shortly. Now. Don't ask me why there's two different sites for essentially the same type of information. I think it's just our great government at work. <clears throat> so it's just as a refresher, let's go over the kind of the three formal documentations that the FDA will use to notify companies and manufacturers of findings. The first one is a Form 483 inspection observations, where the FDA on an inspection visit, if all of the issues that they've seen in their visit have not been resolved before they leave, then the company can expect to get a form, a formal Form 483 listing all of the remaining unresolved findings that the FDA had come across during their visit. A warning letter is the next level higher uh, formality from the FDA, and that's when the FDA has uh, identified that the organization has not resolved the Form 483 findings in, in a, an efficient way or by the deadline that was given to them in that formal letter. So then the company will get a warning letter, and actually the CEO of the company will get the warning letter addressed to that person specifically citing what the remaining violations are that the FDA is expecting that company, that manufactured resolve to continue to do business uh, selling product in the United States. 
The third level you do not want to ever see, and that is a consent decree. That's when the FDA has identified a manufacturer has not resolved all the quality defects through the Form 483 and warning letter process. And that's when the FDA, by the power of the federal government, issues an injunction to halt operations until the violations are resolved. Uh, they can also um, acquire all of the product that's under that quality you know, regulation and, and quarantine it so it cannot be sold or, or taken. This is very extreme actions. Uh, CEOs and corporate leaders can be fined. They can be jailed. Obviously, that's pretty extreme. We don't see that very often, thank goodness. But that's still a possibility when you go down this road. That's why FDA inspections get people's attention because of the significance of what can happen to a business and to people. Now, in my 21 years at Medtronic, I was I was unfortunately did witness one of our business units that we supported from a calibration perspective, um, did go through a process where they received an FDA inspection, got a warning letter, and then unfortunately received a consent decree. And because uh, my department provided calibration services for that business unit, we were, I was involved as the manager of the department, senior engineering manager, that I was involved with the discussions of the quality organization on how to resolve the findings so they could get uh, back uh, to making their product. It took three years for that business unit to get those issues resolved. And I'm here to tell you that's one reason why you do not want to get to a consent degree. The, the magnifying glass focus on everything dealing with quality in that, in that business unit is uh, it's pretty hard to bear. Let's look at the warning letter. This is a snapshot of that screen from the FDA's website on warning letters. It has a nice search tool that you can search on keywords. Uh, you put some other search filter parameters in there. And then uh, if you hit uh, the execute, then the results of your search will be at the bottom of the screen in kind of an Excel spreadsheet format. If you click on the company name, it will open up the report in a PDF format for you to be able to uh, review further in the details. I've learned through my experiences that the best efficient way to search for Calibrate is uh, to use the uh, abbreviation kind of a C-A-L-I-B-R-A-T without the E because that search will get you three variations of the word calibrate. Calibrate, calibrated, and calibration. So in one keyword search, you resolve three different ways that typical warning letters will have uh, the use of calibration rated findings. When I did this more recent research, uh, I was able to get 105 reports out of 2,600 reports that was in the inventory. So about 4% of the warning letters had calibration finding within it. That's pretty low. If you would ask me to make an educated estimate before I ran this on what would be the percentage of calibration issues to reports, I would have put it above 10, perhaps above 15%. So 4%, that's, that's pretty good. This is the Form 483 site. Looks somewhat familiar to the warning letter site. Still has the search criteria, some other criteria. Still gets the results down here at the bottom. But one big improvement that the 483 team has made over the warning letter team at the FDA is they've added a new column in the Excel kind of structure called excerpt where wherever your key term has showed up in this report will be uh, extracted and placed into this column. The benefit, the great benefit of this is that you could export the Excel spreadsheet results and then you could filter these in a, in a pivot table in a lot more efficient and effective manner. Plus the fact 
you can get some idea of interest of this uh, letter without having to actually open it. For me, it saved a lot of time for me to collate through the 326 reports to see which ones might be of interest to me in putting together the top 10 list. So when I did this run uh, the last time, uh, we came up with 326 calibration related findings, 483s out of 2,237 that were in the inventory, which was 15%. That was about where I was, would expect it to be. General observations of what we have seen, and this is a report uh, from Medical Device Magazine Online, or they uh, screen through all the warning letters and put them in different categories, that uh, 43 findings have steadily gone down uh, since 2006. Uh, that's pretty good. And actually back to 2006 levels from here to here. Uh, production and process controls, which is where calibration is under, continues to be a top 10 area. Uh, cited by the FDA and actually coming in at number six. Calibration trends tend to be very basic. No calibration schedules, overdue calibrations, no procedures. Uh, it's rare to have a calibration issue alone. Usually the findings are associated with many other quality system issues. However, one trend that we should be aware of, and that is Many issues are not compliance to the company's own documented requirements. With what we favorite saying in quality is, say what you do and do what you say is what companies tend to violate. And my experiences are that companies tend to over uh, uh, define in the SOPs and then they just cannot live with the, they cannot do objective evidence to show documentation-wise that they have done what they said they, they were going to do. So essentially, uh, many findings are the company has shot themselves in the foot and, and not really uh, uh, any anything more complicated than that. So my experiences have been in the 20 years I was, I was in the biomedical industry and watching uh, the findings and how companies dealt with them is that we tend to overreact when we have a finding in the business because we do not want to get a warning letter. We do not want to consent degree. So human nature is we tend to over document thinking that we will uh, will be better off. In actuality, uh, we make it more complicated to how we can execute what we say we're going to do. Uh, the general categories uh, typically are the 21 CFR Part 820 FDA regulation for medical devices. Then we have 21 CFR Part 210, which is on finished part pharmaceuticals. And then we get 21 CFR Part 58, which is non-clinical laboratory studies, your animal studies for the most part. Okay, the way I have structured uh, the top eight is I, I stole him from David Letterman's uh, show where he did his top 10 list, uh, where he keeps the audience uh, on their feet waiting for what number one can be. So it's very much I've structured this the same way. We'll start off with maybe some common findings and some simpler ones. And then as we get closer to number one, we might get to more uh, complicated uh, findings or significant findings or very unusual findings. It's kind of the way I have structured this. We'll start off with a good example. Uh, in this case, it's on environmental monitoring alarms, which is one of the focus areas of the FDA. Uh, and here it says that the firm did not inspect its temperature and humidity monitoring system alarm to verify its function of triggering an audible alert trip on temperature and humidity excursions as part of the environment controls for the manufacturing floor. And now let's look at the response down here. Here's where it gets, uh, it gets very interesting. Here's where reviewing the FDA warning letters, I think is a more of a learning benefit now than it was in the past. Because the FDA from what I've seen over the past 17 years 
is they used to not provide a lot of guidance when they provided findings. They were very simplistic early on about just saying what the finding is for the organization and that they had two weeks to resolve it and didn't provide too much guidance. Now, the FDA is not only providing detailed guidance, they're actually pro providing expectations of how you need to resolve the 483 or the warning letter. And it gets pretty prescriptive. And I don't know which I like better, the simplistic approach <laughs> or the one that provides a lot of detail because the one that provides a lot of detail takes a lot of work to resolve. And here's a good example here. The response is not adequate because the firm did not provide a copy of new procedure, did not provide training records, did not provide documentation of a retrospective review of past maintenance records, and did not conduct a retrospective review of similar environmental control systems. The FDA has trended to the last five, seven years to where they not only want to see you resolve the issue that was the original finding, they're expecting organizations to do further research in other areas that may be similar and provide that documented evidence back to the FDA that they have done so. That's a different level of work. Now, um, I'm going to give you an example of, a, of an article that I came across, which is an excellent article from Kristen Grummet. She was, at the time, the executive director of NSF Health Systems, and this article was published in 2015. I came across this article when I was doing my research on FDA warning letters that year. And it was really a nice, nice article where Kristen did a nice job identifying the three methods to better respond to 483s. That would get back to what I just showed you from the finding before. So here, number one is understand the FDA's definition of establish. And the way Kristen described it is that if you update an SOP, establish then means that there better be some training evidence that the organization provides that they not only have updated SOP or written SOP and implemented it, that part of that implementation is they have documented evidence they provided training. Number two, address the actual example cited in the 483. Now, <laughs> that sounds simple and sounds obvious, but as I told you before, uh, companies send a shoot themselves in the foot because uh, they don't do what they say they did or have objective evidence. Same way when they respond to FDA warning letters is that they don't address the immediate correction, but they also need to identify the system glitch that allowed the complaint, complaints to non-compliance occur to prevent reoccurrence, which is what they call a system corrective. And then look beyond, which I told you before, which is kind of do that a similar look uh, to see where else a non-compliance could occur, which is what they classify as a preventive action. So in a 483, Kristen recommends, and you can see from the FDA, this an expectation that organizations do an immediate correction, a system corrective, and then a preventive action. Number three, Evaluate the impact of a long-standing deficiency on past practices. Essentially, a res retrospective review. Uh, and she gives the guidelines that if you're doing a significant um, finding over a length of time, that the FDA generally will accept a two-year retrospective review. In other words, looking at historical documentation back, like for calibration records or maintenance records, Go back two years to see if there'll be a similar issue back then as an adequate time frame for a retrospective review. And I saw this in evidence, as I told you from my experience with the business unit that got the consent degree. They did not initially do a retrospective review, but as part of that consent degree, they had to go back two or three years to, uh, to see where these issues were at and resolve them if, 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 if they could be. All right, number seven, 
Uh, this is dealing with another area where the FDA is taking more and more focus and attention. And that is where if you, like in the OOT, a calibration OOT or out of specification for a analytical lab, where if you identify in your response to close out that investigation that you're doing a corrective action, then as part of that, they're expecting that there is some verification of effectiveness to ensure that the corrective action has taken place and actually resolved the issue. So the FDA is expecting that in a particular conducted verification of effectiveness, reoccurrence was prevented and the action did not neg negatively affect the finished device. So one tip that I, I had come across and took note of as I was going through that business unit that was dealing with the consent degree. There was a lot of learnings that came out of that. And I took a lot of notes to make sure that we could implement, uh, update our SOPs accordingly to try to avoid similar situations was the tip on a correction is present tense and does not require an effectiveness check while a corrective action is future tense and does require an effectiveness check. Uh, recommend you, my recommendation is that you sure that your standard operating procedures explains the difference so you can be effective in how you're closing out your OOT reports in your OOS reports. Number six, stern FDA response. Um, this has a couple things going on. Uh, one in the highlighted in the, in the pink here is uh, they had a scale that was uh, being used to weigh small amounts of their pharmaceutical drug and uh, it was calibrated. They were supposed to measure five grams, but it was calibrated 1020, um, which did not bracket the precise amount of drug to be weighed. So that was one issue and bracketing of test points of use condition is another area that FDA is taking particular note of. So they're expecting that wherever the use condition uh, is of an instrument that you're calibrating it below and above uh, across the use condition, what they call bracketing. Additionally, in this issue, the reference gram weight used for scale verification was last calibrated in 2008. If you take note of the date here and take note of the letter, that's more than 10 years that uh, the reference gram was not calibrated. Those of us in calibration are aghast at that, of course, um, but that's the situation. Uh, your response stated use of scales was halted and in your policies were updated to include yearly weight calibration. However, your response did not indicate how you plan to review equipment calibration. And this goes back to Kristen Grummet's recommendations and how to address Form 483s and warning letters. And you can see that this organization did not do that. But the stern response from the FDA accordingly is, so this is a very simple issue of a balanced calibration, which in the calibration world is it's a pretty basic, fundamental, simple thing. But look at what this organization now has to do as a result of not being able to do this well. Review of product distributed that may have been affected by inadequate calibration, of course. Plan to notify customers affected by the inadequate scale calibration. And then corrective and preventive actions for routine management oversight of equipment to ensure detection of equipment performance issues, execution repairs, completion of preventive maintenance, and equipment calibration. And the list goes on and on. This was a simple finding. Now it's going to take some work to resolve. Number five, monitoring chambers. So here we have a microbiology a laboratory uh, using equipment that's not suitable because uh, the incubators are unqualified, which are intended to grow and maintain microbiological cultures. You have not conducted mapping studies to ensure adequate temperature distribution for the incubator. In addition, one incubator did not have an internal thermometer or continuous monitoring device to monitor temperature and ensure it remains within inspection. 
Now look what the expectation is. In response to this letter, provide a detailed plan for qualifying, maintaining, and monitoring not just this incubator that was unqualified, all laboratory equipment. You see how that just got escalated? Yeah. Uh, you better do your warning letter responses very well because uh, you're going to get yourself in a situation that's getting very described for you. Now, the FDA knows that some of the skeletons in organizations' closets is on environmental chambers. And I say that because my own witness of this in operations is that operation engineers know there might be newer and better equipment out there, but because the validation qualifying process is so burdensome, uh, they would rather try to keep limping along my words, of course, um, a older instrument so they could avoid the requalification and validation that goes with it. Unfortunately, what that means is that there's a lot of legacy equipment out there, older equipment, and the FDA knows this, especially for chambers, that may not be adequately qualified, maintained, or monitored. Um, Older, my experience is that the older chambers, let's say older in 10 years, do not have adequate specifications, documented specifications for chamber stability, linearity, or sufficient data for determining location and number of adequate monitoring devices to map hot and cold locations throughout the chamber. And my suggestion to you quality folks out there, and even those of you who own chambers is to review your documented qualification documents for your chambers to see how were they qualified were all the things checked that should be checked in a mapping study was a mapping study even performed usually what i have found for legacy systems is that uh, there's only one spot being monitored and who knows where that spot, how it was picked. And so my suggestion for you owners and quality folks is wherever you have a chamber that's perhaps for sure older than 10 years, but maybe older than five, is one, do you have qualification documents you can easily retrieve and review? That's always a first. And then two, how was it qualified? Was there documented manufacturing specifications in all elements of importance? And was it map to determine where the critical areas that should be continuously monitored? I would venture to say that you will probably find some chambers, be it an oven, refrigerator, incubator, or clean rooms that are, vulnerable, are probably vulnerable to either inadequate qualification documentation or inadequate specifications or inadequate continuous monitoring. Those are three distinctive areas that you should uh, investigate. Number four, this is dealing with uncontrolled spreadsheets. In this case, the firm was using an uncontrolled spreadsheet, which in my mind means not version controlled, not signed off, not, uh, yeah, not verified to track equipment requalification due dates. Spreadsheets is another area of recent focus of the FDA, and then I will I can give you a very painful experience of my own in this regard. Uh, thankfully, there's an excellent resource out there on giving guidance on how you should manage spreadsheets. Gantt five. Uh, which is done by the ISPE organization, is a wonderful document. It's expensive. It's about $200, $300, maybe $400. But if you're in the quality uh, arena uh, or deal with computerized systems, I highly recommend that you have this in your toolkit. It's a risk-based approach to compliant GXP computerized systems. It defines five categories of spreadsheets. It doesn't do it in the main body of the document. You can actually easily miss 
this nice resource within GAMP because actually I did. I had GAMP uh, for several reasons for several years before I realized uh, there was actually an appendix S3 dealing just with spreadsheets. That was a nice find. Um, it's actually the only resource I've come across that gives good guidance on how you deal with spreadsheets with the concept that there are different ways we use spreadsheets. This is an area that I tried to get across auditors, internal auditors specifically, to let them know you can't judge a spreadsheet all in the same way, which was uh, the very extreme way. There's different levels on how spreadsheets are utilized in an organization, and they should be treated differently as a result of that use condition. Gantt 5 does a wonderful job with that categorization. Uh, one, if there's no cal calculations being utilized by that spreadsheet, and people like using spreadsheets because they're, they come with the nice array of rows and columns, which makes it a default formatting for tables, but you may not have any calculations in those tables. Just because it's a spreadsheet doesn't mean you're using it as a spreadsheet. You're using it as a more of a text document for table formatting. No verification is needed for such, even though it is a spreadsheet. It doesn't need to be verified in this situation. Number two, disposable. So when you use it as a calculator, uh, the spreadsheet software verified and you have Excel, for example, by the organization verified for its general use condition, then you would not need to have that spreadsheet handled any differently in that regard. Retained as a document, then you just treat the, you treat the, in the historical records as you would any other document from a verification perspective for storage and control. Gantt 5 talks about a category use as a template i'll get back to that and number five they identify where predominantly the risk is for organizations and believe it or not even in medtronic a fortune 500 company the largest medical device manufacturer in the world <laughs> i saw parts of our business that were still trying to use a spreadsheet when they should have been using a database uh, and they try to rationalize it from the fact they didn't have many things they were controlling or it was simple things that were controlling like due dates. But nonetheless, uh, the FDA and Gantt 5 recommends that you do not use a spreadsheet when a database is the appropriate resource. And that's because spreadsheets have too many FDA 21 CFR Part 11 compliance gaps. 21 CFR Part 11 is the documentation uh, resource for electronic signatures and electronic records. Expectation is that databases have audit trails, sign offs, and uh, security profile, user segregation, and all these are all things that spreadsheets don't do very well, or if at all. So how should we use a spreadsheet? For my team, uh, we're dealing with calibrations where we use test points and take raw data and then try to determine, are, is it uh, in or out of specification and come to some sort of conclusions and documentations and actions. We ultimately went from using individual spreadsheets, which got us in a little bit of difficulty because they weren't very well controlled, and they had different variations of them, which got us in a little bit of a situation. And we came out of that learning by coming up with a different way to handle calculation of raw data for calibrations where we came up with a template, a spreadsheet template for each that matched every calibration procedure that we have. So every calibration procedure would have its own spreadsheet template that was designed, tested, signed off, approved, and version controlled. And one of the neat ways that we did with that template was we had worksheets, tabs at the bottom, different tabs, one tab for raw data collection, one tab for formulas calculations, one tab for the verification that we performed, 
and then another tab that had the revision control sign-offs all in one spreadsheet but we had all the activities taken care of in worksheet tabs that was a pretty slick way to do templates number three data integrity uh, this is pretty interesting in that uh, during a review of out of specification investigation what they found was that between, there was discrepancies between the human machine interface and the entries made by operators and the one example cited here was the operator recorded data into the batch step however the hmi computer automated data indicated that the instrument was not even operational at that time oops you've just been caught in a data integrity violation uh, your quality system does not adequately ensure the accuracy and integrity of the data to support the safety effectiveness and quality of the drugs you manufacture without complete and accurate records you cannot assure appropriate decisions regarding batch release product stability and other matters that are fundamental to ongoing assurance of quality for sure now the buzzword data integrity is the latest one used by the fda and you kind of get the impression that it's a new buzz it's a new expectation of the fda it is not in my 17 years of reviewing fda warning letters this is an area that has consistently been reported on just not using the new buzzword they used other words so it's not something that's necessarily new to us in the in the industry uh, but it is an fda focus of attention whenever there's human data collection uh, with instruments that are purported to be automated with embedded software the fda has a nice guidance document that addresses this expectation so if you're in a if you're in quality in your organization if you're due audits you may want to take a look at this fda guidance document you can probably google it data integrity and compliance with drug cgmp uh, and it's free to download and you get a lot of valuable information number two mini calibration um this is interesting in that um, in your response you indicated your fluid table press and blenders usually remained in place because they were found to um, not be re-qualified after they were moved and so in this case they said you indicated that before every start of a manufa manufacturing process a mini calibration was performed although the data provided seems to be consistent with routine machine setup activities you added that the certain equipment was qualified by the firm's previous owner in 2010 but you were unable to provide qualification documents to our inspection team oops remember i told you to review your legacy qualification data to see if it's one is it even available to be reviewed you may want to do that before an inspection comes up your response was inadequate you did not provide evidence of mini calibration after it was moved to demonstrate it continues to be calibrated and qualified before use in response to this letter include an updated calibration and qualification program for all your manufacturing equipment oh my goodness that is going to take some work a revised procedure for the relocation movement and calibration of manufacturing equipment a lot of detailed expectation here <laughs> and for us in calibration and especially those of us who have been reviewing fda warning letters for 17 years i have come across many different ways that organizations will call a process of calibration just when you think you've heard everyone they come up with a new one and of course mini calibration explains everything unfortunately the key concept here is violated the idea of before and after qualification for a move of critical equipment in a validated process just a very fundamental basic thing expectation but this company does a lot of work to try to get around that number one drum roll the ceo states no calibrations are needed your firm has not established calibration procedures to ensure that equipment is routinely calibrated in addition 
there has been no calibration performed on in process or final inspection equipment because according to your firm ceo no calibrations are needed as the instruments are adequate enough for the firm's purposes oh my goodness this is my new favorite finding now unfortunately you may this is not an isolated case and my own experience i can share with you so we uh, in medtronic uh, a calibration department we managed to support five different business units that were doing five different manufacturing product lines. I got a call one day from the VP of R&D of one of those business units asking for me and my QA manager to come to a meeting with his uh, QA folks on a discussion of what they were thinking they were going to do, which was remove all R&D equipment from the calibration schedule. And we're talking thousands of instruments well when my quality manager and i got together to discuss this we're like you have got to be kidding we got to find some way to walk them back off of this and i kid you not we went to a meeting and they for sure wanted to do that and me and the quality manager went through them step by step of why you may not want to do this and we have objective evidence to show you why your instruments are not holding up because we have a we do have evidence of out of tolerances for 5% of your equipment and so on and so forth. Uh, eventually, they decided not to do that, which uh, we were very happy. But I was shocked how close that business unit actually came to doing that. And that culture, that mindset, five to seven years later, they got their consent decree. So there was a mindset in the business, not just dealing with calibration, but dealing with other quality things where evidently they had this kind of shortcut mentality and they got themselves in trouble ultimately. There's a secondary thing going on in this finding. So we have a bonus and that is there's no requirement for inspection or measuring tools made in-house to undergo a type of measurement system analysis that confirms the suitability of its intended use. So my recommendation here is, how are you ensuring that in-house built tooling is checked periodically for wear? My own experience is that we tend to do a very good job when we're doing calibrations of tooling internally, but when we outsource tooling, we don't do as good a job of ensuring that whoever is doing that tooling is uh, is uh, doing the things we need to make sure that the tooling is adequate for, for use. And where is an area that the FDA is getting a little bit more nosy about when dealing with tooling is because they know more than likely that there'll be some gaps there in organizations. So some key takeaways. Remember the FDA has two very useful websites. I would encourage you to test those out. You can search on keywords like HEPA filters or clean rooms. You'd be amazed what information you might glean from that. So I would experiment on your own for areas even outside of calibration that can be helpful to you to see trends or what might be the latest things that the FDA is focusing their attention on. Uh, follow Kristen Grumman's three methods for submitting FDA responses. An excellent, excellent suggestion from Kristen. Uh, remember, calibration findings are typically very basic in nature. Uh, and usually associated with many other quality issues. And the latest trends continue to be in data integrity, not a new buzzword necessarily, environmental monitoring, mapping, legacy equipment issues, and training. Thank you for attending our webinar. I hope you find uh, the information helpful to you in your own organizations. And there's some things there that give you some nice food for thought. You can get a hold of me at this uh, email address and I'd be happy to help in any way that I can. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. That was that was interesting to, to see an overview of all this various different findings these organizations are getting. Um, appreciate you, you know, joining us on our uh, monthly webinar. Uh, and now we're gonna go ahead and we do, I do see some questions coming in. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and go through that. 
in just a few seconds here, let me just pull some of the questions. You can still type, continue to type questions. We have some time uh, if you'd like. Let's just see here. So Walter, why am I pulling up some of these questions? I have one for you. Sure. You know, you mentioned in your uh, in your presentation that the findings on calibration have decreased over time. What do you think that's contributed to? That's a very good question. Um, my my own thoughts on that are that. Uh, one, I think our organizations are getting more and more mature in our processes and that we are learning from uh, past audits and from other experiences. And so we know how to better avoid. So that's one. And I think also organizations are using consultants maybe more and that consultants can bring in those learnings from their own uh, review of the different businesses that they visit and things that they're seeing. So I think those two two things are contributing to a decline. We're just getting overall smarter about uh, maturing our processes. Okay, all right, all right, so let's go to our first question here from the audience, uh, medical devices. Does a calibration service provider uh, must categorize as a critical supplier? Must be categorized as a critical supplier. So for medical mm -hmm. device manufacturers, does the calibration service provider have to be categorized as a critical supplier? Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Um, I think organizations handle that differently, maybe to the same end result. They may not call it critical supplier. They may have a different um, segregation or risk-based approach to that. My own experience is that we went through, the company went through a learning curve where they, they had to do a better job of managing different services provided. You know, the focus of attention was initially with the direct impact to product, which was any service or product directly uh, impacting the process. And now it's getting wider and wider to it's more and more, all services now are being more managed as uh, what in the, you know, the typical way we used to classify suppliers was direct suppliers and indirect suppliers and calibration was in the category of indirect suppliers. And my witnessing our own company's journey on that was they focused pretty hard on direct suppliers for a long time. And kind of, you know, the indirect suppliers were just kind of on their own <laughs> to a certain extent. But over the years, the FDA expectation has been for organizations to manage their indirect suppliers at almost at the same level as direct suppliers. So almost to the point where there's really no difference between the two. So that, I guess that's the way I would answer that. Okay. All right, Walter, how does FDA justify their guidance on OOTs without ever considering measurement uncertainty? Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't know that they purposely avoid uncertainty measurements. Um, I think it's the point where um, it's an area where the FDA tends to give general guidance to organizations and it's up to organizations to determine what level they need to do to be adequate for their intended purpose. And for my own example in uh, running a calibration lab uh, at Medtronic was that Yes, the FDA didn't necessarily put any guidance out on uncertainties in their uh, regulations, but I inherently knew, and my department inherently knew that as quality, as calibration experts, subject matter experts, we know that measurement uncertainty is an important aspect of an overall measurement quality system. And so we ensured that we were taking care of that at our level. Um, when an auditor is looking at reports, they may not get down to the uncertainty aspect of it, but they're certainly looking at the issues of how was the out of tolerance report investigated? 
was it a proper investigation? And they'll keep digging until they get comfortable that there was an adequate investigation. Okay. I kind of do have something funny here. So this must be someone that might know you. <laughs> and I have to ah. read it just because it's comical. It's how could you choose a Camaro instead of a charger? Ha ha ha. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, and then, uh, okay, yeah, I can share with you that later. All right. Another uh, question so from my curiosity is that you had made a, uh, well, in all your slides, you talked about Kristen Grimmett's uh, how to respond. So um, yes. she mentioned looking at historical data. So I know. You know, us being an accreditation body, that it depends on the nonconformance that we write. And it does require a root cause and for the organizations to really look hard and depending on that finding to see, you know, how did this really occur and, and have you put all your fires out? So, yeah, I was just curious yeah. with that one. You had mentioned something about two years, something yes. like a two years of review. So, when someone's mm -hmm. trying to respond to one of these, Findings. I don't know if that was a if that was a warning or the other form, the 108483 form. How long does mm -hmm. it take an organization to close out one of these issues with the FDA? Yeah. So when it gets to and 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 Kristen specifically in in in, in the retrospective review area, talking about when a company needs to implement uh, is addressing a long-standing deficiency or a, a very uh, complicated one or has a large area of uh, impact, the FDA is inspecting that, okay, this is pretty big, how did we get here? And so they wanna, they wanna be feel comfortable that the company has done an adequate review of the past to make sure that there isn't, uh, you know, a larger iceberg underneath the tip, so to speak. And so in that regard, it can take some time. Now, what the FDA is inspecting on these is within a matter of weeks, for the company to come back with their plan. Doesn't necessarily mean that they've closed out all the issues, but they have addressed all the issues from, from an investigation perspective to where now they have a plan on how they're going to address it and resolve it. And so that plan can, can be over an amount of time, but the FDA is also expecting that it still be taking uh, due diligence that it's done quickly and rapidly. Right, that you're not using that opportunity to say, well, we'll take we'll take our time doing this. We've we've let the FDA know we have a plan. <laughs> no, no, no. You need to have a plan. You need to be aggressive about it. Uh, but you do have some time that you can uh, get these things uh, looked into and closed out. Okay. Well, did you mind clicking back one slide? Someone wanted to get your contact information, and it's on your slide. There we go. Okay. Do you see a lot of? Uh... Yeah, I know in a lot of the CFRs, but I know the FDA has come a long way with promoting or using 1725 accreditation. Uh, do you see less errors, in your opinion? Is it an opinion of manufacturers using accredited sources? From, so, you know, I, even though I know they're not responsible for making sure that the calibration labs aren't responsible necessarily for, for organizations to maintain but i know that they can be a resource for them to help them you know keep up with uh, intervals and maintaining their equipment and appropriateness yeah so this is a uh, having been on the healthcare uh metrology committee uh, since 2002 i have seen the journey <laughs> over 20 years on this topic and it's one of those areas where we're getting you know better and better i i would say it wasn't some one of these things that we quickly after just a year or two, we knew how to do things. No, it was a journey and it's still a journey, actually. So um, what we have found is that more and more suppliers are certainly becoming accredited to ISO 17025, even the what we would call the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, are are seeing that an accreditation process is valuable to them from a marketing perspective and obviously for a business perspective. 
And so they're getting more and more, uh, there's more and more of them getting accredited, which obviously makes it easy for us and organizations. Um, and when we're trying to manage suppliers, indirect suppliers, that the more of them that are accredited, certainly the, the lower the uh, resource it is for us to ensure that they're doing adequate work. But what I will still tell you is that we still got ways to go there because what we know is ISO 17025 accredited suppliers, it's all about the scope of accreditation. So you could have you could have a company say they're accredited, but they only have one parameter that's in their scope, even though they're doing business with 25 other parameters. So what kind of accreditation do they really have? You see what I'm saying there? Uh, uh, so it's uh, for me, it's all the, the devil's in the details. And even companies that are accredited uh, are on their own journey of quality and managing quality and defect control. I mean, I have to say in my, in my own experiences by utilizing um, accredited suppliers, there will still work to be done with getting better documentation and better work out of those organizations. It wasn't necessarily foolproof. You still had to do, we, even to when I retired, we were still doing 100% inspections of certi certificates coming from our outside suppliers because we were still seeing too many defects, uh, even from the accredited suppliers. So it's still a journey, but it is getting better and better. Yeah, and even just recently, the last two years, talking about medical devices, and I know FDA handles a lot of different things, but they have just, uh, you know, came out with a pilot now, I believe it's going out of a pilot stage for the FDA ASCA program um, for laboratories uh, to become accredited. So it's the basic safety and biocompatibility and it uses 17025. So I think we're gonna see improvement from that program too, because there it starts talking about accredited suppliers and having, uh, you know, those appropriate calibrators uh, perform their uh, calibrations too. So I think we'll start seeing some changes maybe over the next couple of years with that. Okay, if you don't mind clicking Walter to the next slide, maybe the next other one. Okay, so I think that uh, ends it for our question session. Just wanted to bring everyone's attention to uh, a few upcoming webinars we have next month on the 21st. Uh, we're going to be doing a free webinar on evaluation of measurement uncertainty for testing laboratories uh, with our program manager, Matt Zika. And then on March 29th, we will be doing a uh, another uh, free webinar here on 1702585 on actions to address risk and opportunities with Mike Kramer, our calibration and inspection program manager. So those should be on the website now. Uh, please register, stick them on your calendar. I'd love to have you to attend. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's our contact information again. If you have anything that comes up for PGLA from accreditation standpoint, there's my email. And then again, here's Walter's. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Walter, thank you very much. I hope we can have you back again uh, for another webinar. You have a lot of experience and uh, really enjoyed your session today. Everyone enjoy thank your you day. Very much and again, <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.